a new and bigger headquarters location, an acquisition, the opening of a third office, and a challenging, to say the least, redevelopment project in New York Times Square. These are some of the recent highlights for the full-service design firm Mancini Duffy, whose CEO and co-owner William Mandera joins us today. Welcome, Bill. Hey there. How are you? Bill, what prompted your firm to open a third office in Red Bank, New Jersey? And, and how did the pandemic shape how that office was set up and staffed? So it's interesting. Um, there's really... Both of those, there's two reasons for Red Bank. Um, the first reason was to really leverage some of the relationships that some of my partners have who live down that area and have many contacts and afford us the ability to do work there. Um, and in reference to the pandemic, quite frankly, you know, people want to have different options for working and having an office in Red Bank allows for a lot of our staff that lives down in Monmouth County in the area to have a place to work and an office to go to. Um, without having to come to Manhattan. So it just gives other options for our, our staff that makes it great for them. Got it, got it. Your company also expanded in May by acquiring a firm in New York called Gertler and Wente Architects. Uh, what attracted your firm to that company and you know what do they bring to the table? So there's a lot of things that attracted us. I think initially having met with Jeff and Larry, we share a lot of the same values on how to run a firm, uh, how to treat people and how to treat our clients. Um, so from day one, that was apparent that it was a great alignment. Um, and, you know, what they bring to the table is is a very robust healthcare practice and multifamily practice. Um, you know, Mancini, we've done health, we've done not, we've done some minor healthcare work. I've done some minor healthcare work and we've done a fair amount of multifamily, but not to the, not the, uh, the level that Gertler and Wente has done. And bringing that on has just been great for us. And um, in particular, Mark Goldstein, who runs the healthcare practice, has been great to have along on the team as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. That acquisition coincided with your firm moving into a new headquarters on 8th Avenue in New York City at a time when a lot of other AEC firms are kind of backing away from office space. Um, provide some details about the new office in terms of size, employee capacity, and it's my understanding that you tripled the size of your design lab, if you can elaborate on that as well. Sure thing. I'm actually sitting in our design lab right now, um, which is great. We, you know, our old design lab was kind of happened organically from my partner giving up his office initially, a little 10 by 15 room to what we were able to build out from a conference room that wasn't used very much to now have the really having the ability to design and do it, put exactly what we want here. So we've learned, learned from some previous mistakes that we've made. Um, and and we, so what we have here is this design lab with pretty much every piece of technology that you can imagine. It's also really the centerpiece of our office. Um, our office here on in, in Avenue is about twelve thousand square feet. Um, we have we we have a hot desk desking system where we can, we can at any point in time we can fit you know about ninety to one hundred people that we have here at our firm. But for the most part, we're on a we're, we're on a flex schedule where we're you know three days in the office and two flex days. So what you do is we have hot ticking, which a lot of our clients do as well. So we figured we would embrace that, where you come in and you check out and you use a desk for a day or a conference room, and it's worked out great for everybody. Um, we've you know we we've tried to really be progressive with the office as well and embrace some other things we do with our clients. So by way of example. We don't have a receptionist. Uh, we don't have a reception or a traditional reception area either. When you come into our office, you're greeted uh, with a little iPad and a bar. Uh, hmm. It was funny because it, it, when we were sitting around thinking of what to do, we were coming up with all these ideas. And my colleague, Michael Kipfer, brought up the fact that when you go to a restaurant, you're waiting for a table. What do you do? You, you sit at a bar and kind of really ties into our culture here of, you know, having working hard and playing hard as well. So we're, we're pretty excited about it. You know, as far as backing away from office space, I think that, you know, we design as architects places where people go to work, places where people go on vacation, places where people, you know, eat, drink, and, and all of those things. And to sit there and say you're an expert on that from your kitchen just doesn't really work for me and doesn't work for our partners here either. Mm -hmm. It feels hypocritical. Mm -hmm. um, so... So, so to wit, your your office. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, your firm was on the design build team for TSX Broadway, a two point five billion dollar, five hundred and fifty thousand square foot mixed use building that included 
elevating the Palace Theater 30 feet or six stories above ground and creating a new entertainment location. Talk to me about the client's vision for this project and why such a complex design and engineering maneuver was necessary. Well, it really is an amazing project and it's been in our office for, gosh, six or seven years. Um, and yeah, the initial vision was to create something in Times Square where there was nothing and where there really wasn't the ability for it. And the reason it's a complicated project is just that, that there's only so much space, A, in Manhattan and B, especially in a place like Times Square. And the fact that we were able to elevate the Palace Theater and create all of that new space over there is really spectacular. And um, I'm very proud to be a part of it. And it's it's been quite an engineering feat as well as uh, some of the other parts of the project. But really, the, the initial vision was to create a premier space in Times Square for the future that, that it, 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 again, it has, it'll have a world-class Broadway theater. There will be premium entertainment space there. There's going to be an amazing hotel with, with views like no other. There will be a roof deck that, again, will be like no other in the world. And there's even the stage that will go out to Times Square that could host any number of events. It's going to be pretty spectacular. And all of that's made possible by, realistically, the initial vision of elevating that theater and creating all of that space comes right out to Times Square. Am I mm -hmm. correct in my understanding about this that the, that one of the entertain one of the performance spaces so is sort of like a platform that's going to levitate or or extend or cantilever out over the over the the sidewalk in the street? Uh, absolutely, it will extend out into Times Square, into you know right right across from the TKTS booth. Um, it will also house the world's largest operable LED doors, which will open up to bring the stage. But we'll also have an entertainment space that when it's not exposed to the street, will can face inward and have entertainment events within the building as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Your portfolio includes Peloton's first headquarters on West, 50, West 25th Street, as well as several high-profile building repositions such as 888 Broadway. What were the client's design goals, and what were these projects' challenges and noteworthy features? So both of those projects were with the same client. Um, at the time, they were Normandy Real Estate Partners. Now they're Columbia Property Trust um, and outstanding client. And, you know, their initial vision for 25th Street was, you know, this building was in pretty bad shape when they acquired it. It was, you know, it had some loft or loft law tenants that lived in there. Um, the building was fairly dilapidated. So the vision was to take that really kind of this blighted piece of real estate and turn it into an A-plus office building, which we did throughout a series of maneuvers, including, you know, a, a full facade re re a full facade renovation. Um, we filled in light wells on the side. We were able to relocate the area into a penthouse that was used for Peloton. And it would actually really would sold Peloton on the space. And then with 888 Broadway, that was a little bit of a different project because it was already a functioning building with ABC Home and Carpet, um, but they didn't need all the space in there. So it was a very complicated deal for our client to pull off as far as ownership relationships and things like that. And we were able to create, again, some plus office space with a great penthouse in there, not only in an active building where ABC had to be active the entire time, but within a historic building. Um, that was you know, under the purview of Landmarks Preservation Committee. So there was a lot of uh, maneuvers. We were, we were able to create a new lobby for the commercial tenants along 19th Street in this historic building, only because we were able to ascertain that when the building was initially built back in like, you know, 100 years ago or more, there actually was a lobby there. So we were actually re mm -hmm. restoring the building by creating a new lobby on 19th Street. Just out of curiosity, oh, are you finding your your the work that you're doing these days is more renovation than new construction, or is it a, is still a balance? It's a good balance, and I think it depends on where you are. You know, I mean, we're doing new buildings in Manhattan. Um, there's a lot more renovation within New York City in general. Uh, when you go out more to suburban areas like New Jersey or Long Island or, or Connecticut or even Philadelphia, there's more new building. Um, which is, it's a fairly easy equation because there's just more space out there. So yeah. there's not a lot of space. It's a lot harder to build a building in Manhattan, but there certainly are a lot of new buildings in Manhattan that we're doing, but the repositioning seems to be a, a, a real great niche for us because, um, you know, you're able to take something that's there 
make it better without filling up landfills with with, with buildings and and really restoring kind of some of the original character of these these parts of Manhattan and mm. and and the outer boroughs as well. Mm. You mentioned uh, your work outside of the city per se. What's next for your firm? Do you think? I mean, is are you looking to expand outside of the New York metro area and looking to get into different practices? Tell me a little bit of kind of, kind of what the five year plan is. Sure. So we're definitely looking to expand. We're already doing work in places like Nashville and Texas and Florida and California for some of our clients. And for sure, we're ex- you know we're we're exploring the idea of going going out growing out into other places like that. But we're certainly also exploring the idea of you know expanding right here in New York City and New Jersey as well. Uh, we've since we Christian and I. Uh, since we took over the firm, one of the things we intentionally wanted to do was diversify the practice. When I first came to Mancini, it was probably about 90% corporate interiors, which is great. But, you know, as, as corporate interiors go, so do firms. And I learned that the hard way working for a firm that did that in 2009. So, we're, you know, we've, we've diversified into other industries like industrial, like hospitality, um, even storage, um, multifamily, now healthcare. You know, the next big thing for us, quite frankly, is probably the life sciences area that we're looking to grow into. Mm-hmm. Well, there's plenty of plenty of competition there right now. <laughs> there, there, there is, there is, and I think we can, I think we can offer some unique uh, propositions to that. Mm-hmm. Bill, does the DEI movement uh, affect your plans to any extent? I mean, in terms of diversity and bringing a little bit more equity to the projects that you're working on. Of course, it does. Um, you know, I, I would say that. It's not something new for us. Uh, we've always believed in in diversity and inclusion, and we've always we've never we, we, what we don't do is necessarily go around bragging about it. But we've always just kind of put our money where our mouth is, and that's just how we are here. We are, I believe, we're we're, we're a firm of probably sixty percent women in our firm. Hmm. Um, our, our ownership is quite diverse here as well, as is our leadership group. And you know, it's not something that we you know. I, I, what I don't like is when people try to check a box with it. It's certainly not something we do. It's something we believe in. And it's just something we practice, and and that's what we do. And we're very proud of that. Bill, thanks for taking the time to speak with me. I know this. We had a couple of go rounds tech technically, so but it, this worked out great. I'm thank, thanks a lot for your time. I appreciate having me on. Thanks so much. Yeah, and thanks to our audience for joining us. This is John Caulfield from Building Design and Construction. 